Welcome to another episode of Varsity 360. I'm the Colombian's Micah Rice, joined today by Tim Martinez. And can you believe it, Tim? We are in the final week of the regular season of high school football, and we're here to talk about it here at the First Pacific Financial Studio. Again, thanks to First Pacific Financial for allowing us to use this equipment and this space. And like I always say, when you support high school sports, you support the community at large. And uh, But there's been a lot of high school sports, uh, especially on the football field, to happen that have led us to this point. Uh, some very consequential Week 9 games. And so we're here, we're here to break it down all the scenarios about which teams need to win to get into those week 10 playoff games. And so Tim, where are we at? (laughs) Well, um, you know, so uh, as you get into week nine, there's, there's always the chance about tiebreakers and possibilities. And we've had some over the last couple of years, last year in the three, a, we had a tiebreaker at doc Harris. I think in 2016, we did one in the two A's in 2015 in the four A's. Um, they're fun. They're wild yeah. events to go to. But uh, I know that, you know, a lot of uh, coaches and administrators, they're like, eh, it's a little bit of a headache to have to deal with. So uh, coming into this week nine of the season, we actually have possibilities of tiebreakers in all three greater St. Helens, like the 4A, the 3A, and the 2A. So we're going to go over and sort of kind of hit on some of the highlights of uh, the most likely events. Um, a lot of this information will be in the, my uh, column, which comes out on and Wednesday's Colombian, a little more uh, down to all the minor d- details in the minutia, yeah. but uh, we'll, we'll hit the highlights today. All right. Well, let's start with the forays. Uh, obviously, last week, some consequential games. Uh, Skyview getting a much needed win over Battleground, a bounce back bit game for the Storm after they uh, dropped their uh, big tilt to Camus. Uh, Skyview really didn't look uh, uh, anything less than a great team in a 49 to 10 win over Battleground. And Camus takes care of business 52 to 17 over Union. So this obviously leaves Camus in control of its own destiny at 2 and 0 in, in the league standings. Uh, Skyview right behind them. Uh, Battleground also was something to play for. <clears throat> Union and Skyview clash this Friday. Uh, where does the 4A Greer St. Helens League stand as far as possibilities? So, so with just three league games, yeah. it, you pretty much go into week nine with every team uh, still in the play. Mm-hmm. And they have three berths to the week 10 playoffs this year, which is different from last year when they just had two. So really, even Union, even though they dropped their first two league games, if Union beats uh, Skyview, at worst, uh, the Titans would be in a three-team tiebreaker possibility. At best, they'll they'll uh, uh, get in and on their on the merit of that one win. So, um, I think what we see in the first uh, two weeks of the league play is that I think the most likely uh, uh, outcome this weekend is uh, a win from Camus against Battleground and a win by Skyview over Union. And if that happens, then everything's sorted out. Mm-hmm. Uh, Camus is the league champion. They're 3-0. and And then Skyview and Battleground also get the next two playoff spots. Now, um, then it goes to a seating committee. There's a week 10 seating committee uh, among the, the all the schools in the four western districts of the WIAA. Mm-hmm. So that's District 1, 2, 3, and 4. It's all up and down I-5. And uh, 22 teams will be in, put into a pool. They'll get seated out, and uh, those matchups will be released on Sunday. Um, if it happens that Camus and Skyview both win, those two both teams will be eight and one. Battleground will go in at seven and two under that scenario. Um, very good chance that both Camus and Skyview would host mm-hmm. a Week Ten uh, playoff as they did last year, and then Battlegrounds kind of would be on uh, probably on the bubble. And I'm thinking that the other leagues up north would probably wouldn't want to give the 4A greatest in all three home games. Right. So, you know, Battleground would probably slot somewhere 12, 13, 14, 15 seed and be on the road most likely. So, um, but then again, if Battleground should, you know, upset, you know, I don't want to say upset because I never like saying upset in right. high school sports. It's <laughs> just, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, but if Battleground should beat Camus, then they go into eight and one. And then, you know, who knows how the seating committee will, will work it out. So, uh, that's the 4A. 
Um, and then uh, you know, we're, in, we're in another tiebreaker session with the 3A. Yeah, it seems like it's almost been par for the course the past few years that uh, you need some extracurricular activities to sort out the 3A when it comes to their playoff bursts. Uh, five teams, two playoff bursts. We know one thing for certain. Mountain View is the league champion. They, they wrapped that up uh, last weekend by taking care of business against Heritage. Mountain View gets to, um, uh, they, they play a non-league game against Richland, uh, you know, so they get to try a few things. Uh, you, you don't want to ever say you get to relax and enjoy a, a football game, but they Mountain View is taking care of what they needed to take care of. They're going to go into the, the seating as uh, the Greater St. Helens League champion. So really, they're playing for, to try to boost their resume against Richland. Yeah, it's a little bit different now that there's this seating committee of these week uh, 10 games. And in the 3A, as opposed to the 4A, where it's just the four districts on the west side of the state and then the districts on the east side of the state, they do their own things. In the 3A, because there's so few schools on the east side of the state, pretty much the entire state comes together with this week 10 uh, uh, playoff, the state preliminary round. So all there's going to be uh, basically uh, 32 teams playing for the 16 spots to the state tournament the next week. Uh, again, they will be seated on Sunday. Um, and so it's a little bit different because in the before they had that seating committee, Mountain View would be in a situation now where they could you know, maybe rest some starters, maybe play them for a half, bring in some JV kids, because the game, the non-league game, wouldn't matter. They would be the number one seed from the Greater St. Helens League, and they would already be in, uh, paired up against uh, some other opponent. Mm. But with the seeding committee, now they kind of have to bolster their resume and make themselves look more deserving, get a higher seed. Well, and, and I think that's got to be the case in the 3A, especially where you have some absolute juggernauts that you do not want to get paired with in week 10. You don't want to go up against a Yelm, an O'Day, an Eastside Catholic. And so anything you can do to kind of get that little boost and, and maybe set yourself up for a, a favorable draw, I think you want to get done, especially yeah. in the 3A. Yeah, so, so it, it's, you know... So I'm sure Mountain View is going to go into this game. They're going to be working on some things to, to get better. Um, but, uh, you know, I think I think they also want to, you know, finish the season strong and then put themselves in the best position to get uh, a good seed. And But I still expect they'll probably be home in Week 10 as they were, uh, as the number one team was last year, which was Kelso. Uh, as far as the other teams go, uh, Evergreen is the one that kind of controls its mm -hmm. own situation right now. So if Evergreen goes up to Kelso – and they beat the Highlanders on Friday, they get the other, they get the second seed and everything's sorted out. Um, if Kelso beats Evergreen, then that's the tiebreaker situation. Should Prairie also beat uh, Winless uh, Heritage, then you would have Prairie, Evergreen, and Kelso in a 3T tiebreaker. And that would probably happen, uh, we're guessing, on Monday. The dates and times and stuff of the possible scenario, uh, tiebreakers haven't been set yet. They'll probably get it pinned down as they head most or closer to kickoff on Friday. Um, we're expecting it would probably be on uh, on Monday, and then it's uh, another tiebreaker situation like they had last year. Last year, that Mountain View was able to uh, survive, uh, but Evergreen, obviously, they want to take care of business, but going up to Kelso is uh, always a tough you know, tough tasks to do. Uh, Mountain View, you know, they handled all their other league opponents except Kelso, which they had to go to overtime and stop a two-point conversion in overtime. The Highlanders always bring it when uh, when they are playing at home. So big game in the 3A Greater St. Helens League there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Kelso, Kelso was obviously one play away from changing this whole Week 9 dynamic. Um, so, you know, I think Evergreen certainly knows that they got to be ready to play on Friday because it's uh, – It'll probably be a battle up there. Yeah. Well, the 2A, for as little clarity as the 2A Greater St. Helens League has offered us throughout the year, we do know that we have a really big Week 9 game, uh, a showdown that's been a few weeks in the making. Uh, Woodland and Ridgefield, uh, that is for the league title. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the league, you know, had you know, a lot of surprising early season events. Things have kind of settled a little bit here in mm -hmm. the last couple of weeks. We kind of sort of see where, where teams are lining up, but Woodland at Richfield on Friday will be for the league title. The winner will be the outright league title. They'll be the number one seed. And in a two-way, they do set seeds. There's no Week 10 seeding commission co committee because they're just going to play four teams from the two-way Evergreen Conference mm -hmm. in District 4. So uh, whoever wins Woodland-Richfield on Friday is the league champion. They'll be the number one seed. They'll play the number four team from the EFCO. Um, and they'll be at home 
in week 10. If Woodland loses, if Richfield wins, Richfield's number one, and then Woodland knows it can't be any worse than the number two seed. Mm. So they know win or lose, they're going to be home week 10 and probably either playing the number four team or the number three team from FCO, depending on the result. Richfield, uh, because of, you know, their head-to-head during the course of the season, could still be in a three-team tiebreaker situation. So if Woodland beats Richfield, then we also have Washougal playing Hawkinson and mm-hmm. Bay Peen, Hudson's Bay Peen, uh, playing Columbia River. If Bay and Hawkinson both win and Richfield loses, all three of those teams are 5-2 and two in league. Bay beat Richfield. Richfield beat Washougal. Washougal beat Bay. And uh, from what I hear, heard from the, the officials within the league, they're going to go ahead and play that off. Even mm-hmm. though one, all, three, all three of those teams would be guaranteed week 10 spots, it's still a meaningful tiebreaker because, one, the winner of the tiebreaker would be number two, and they would be home in week yes. 10. And then the other two teams would be on the road, and the number four team has got to go up and play Tom Water. Yeah, th- that's the one matchup you always want to avoid in week 10. It's like, you know, don't run into that juggernaut that they have up there off of I-5 uh, uh, south of Olympia. Yeah, so that's that's the game that I think most people would want to, and I think that's part of the, the, the home field advantage for being a number two and then avoiding Tom Water is really what's at stake. So they'll, they'll play that off if that happens Monday or Tuesday. They haven't got quite settled off that either. Um, Again, but if it's Woodland, number two, mm-hmm. then Woodland would have already beaten Bay and Washougal. So yes. the tiebreaker goes to the Beavers in that situation. And then the tiebreaker then breaks between Washougal and Bay, and Washougal beat Bay. So Washougal would be three, and Bay would be four. And Bay would be going up to play Tumwater in Week 10. Um, there are other scenarios. If Hawkinson should come up and beat Washougal, um, then there are, you know, other, uh, you know, if, if Bay loses to River and Hawkinson beats Washougal, then you have a three-way tie between Hawkinson, Washougal, and Bay for the last two spots. And mm-hmm. One team's out, and so they do not have a tiebreaker in that. Um, so basically, if you're playing a game this Friday in the two-way greatest in the Netherlands League, you just need to win. Yes, it and means then, something. <laughs> and then, then you'll know at least, uh, you know, you'll be playing in Week 10. If you if, if if you win, except for Hawkinson, Hawkinson's the one that doesn't know. They they know at least they'll be in a tiebreaker at the very very least, mm-hmm. or they'll be in week ten. So, um, yeah, everyone's going to be scoreboard watching the those three games and keeping an eye on how that all shakes out. Yeah, because I, I mean the two A is always fascinating me just because of that dynamic that uh, y- you know if you finish in a certain spot you're going to be playing at home if you're in one of those top two spots, but also just with the Evergreen Conference how strong it's been at the top of that league in recent years that uh, y- you, you you want to do everything you can to avoid the Tum Waters, to avoid the WF West, to avoid some of those teams that uh, have made some pretty deep runs in recent years. Yeah, I mean, last year, the the crossover Week 10, the Ever- Evergreen Conference won three of the four uh, uh, playoff games um, in Week 10 last year. So Washougal actually had to, to, to work to get past a four-seed Shelton last year. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they're, they're tough matchups there to be had. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, a few years back, Washougal had to go up to WF West. This is when uh, Brevin B was playing, and they won that Week 10 game. Then they won first round state, and they got over to the quarterfinals that yeah. state. So, uh, you know, you never know how it's going to break, and, and if teams, you know, catch a hot streak good things can happen so it's the beauty of the playoffs you can get hot at the right time and go on a run uh how about the trico league 1a trico <laughs> league is either going to be really clear cut or it's it's kind of muddled i i still haven't heard back as the time that we're recording this podcast on tuesday afternoon exactly how some of those tiebreaker situations the the easiest thing to make things clear would be if uh, la center beats castle rock on friday the center beats Castle Rock on Friday. The center is undefeated in league. They're the league champions again. Then Seton would, would plot in at number two mm-hmm. and Castle Rock number three. And again, the top two teams would be at home in week 10 where the three and the four seats are going up and playing um, the 1A Evergreen Conference uh, opponents up there. So, um, yeah, so if the center wins, and it doesn't matter what happens with Seton and Kingsway because right. then they would be tied with Castle Rock for second and they beat Castle Rock. So uh, Seton knows that if, if they beat Kingsway on Friday, then they'll be the one or two seed, unless 
Castle Rock beats La Center, uh, and then you've got three teams with one league loss, and I'm not sure exactly how they're going to break that tie if they would also play that off uh, because you have two teams at home and, and another team going on the road. The fourth seed in the Trico is a little bit it's a little bit odd. Um, Stevenson was a longtime member of the Trico League for years and years and years. More recently, their enrollment numbers actually placed them in the 2B classification, but they would opt up and stay in the Trico League. Mm-hmm. This most recent classification process, they decided to play where their numbers put them, which is in 2B. But what they've discovered over the last few years is that means that uh, in order to play league games in the 2B League, they've got to drive past all these Trico schools. Yeah. they got to drive past Kingsway and Seton, and you can count Fort in there, and then LeCenter before they reach their first to be opponent, which is Kalama. And then to find their next closest league opponent, they've got to pass Castle Rock to get to Toledo and then beyond. And so after a couple of years of uh, making a lot of bus drives and a lot of late nights, mm-hmm. they've decided that they want to come back to the Trico. And so they're in this process where they're sort of half in, half out in some sports. And in football, they play a September schedule where they play all Trico league teams. But their October schedule is against to be teams like on Alaska and Kalama. Adna. But there's a way that the Stevenson can get in by winning a certain number of those Trico. They've won three out of their four. So it looks like they've done enough. But again, I have, haven't heard formally from the league to say, yes, they will be the number four seed or whether there's another way that one of the other teams can get in. Did, did the league uh, mention what metrics they might use to make that decision? No, or the, only, that, yeah. the only thing I got what, from them is that, no, oh, Stevenson is still alive for a playoff spot, and we should know more after week eight. So they're having a meeting, I think, today, yeah. this afternoon to sort that out, to kind of clarify that. Um, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a funky situation because Stevenson's not full-fledged. Right. They will be in reclassification process next year. They're going to go it and op- opt up, and they'll be back in the Trico, and everything will just... Back where they belong. Back, back Be- because they the belong. funny thing about Stevenson is they found that not only did they have to drive a, a, a lot more mileage to, to get to these 2B league games, they were often playing teams that were just as good, if not better, than some of the competition in, they in, play in the yeah. Trico. In some of the sports and in football, most definitely. I mean, the yeah. 2B uh, football league that they have up there is the best in the state and a lot of really, really good teams. And so they were having... Uh, trouble trying to compete with, with those teams. So it was a long bus rises and, <laughs> and, and bus rides and, and, and results that weren't very favorable. So so just to wrap it up, Tim, how do you think this week nine is going to break? Do you think we're going to get uh, uh, the predictable outcomes and clean results, or do you think chaos is going to reign? I, you know, if, if I had to predict, um, I think we're going to have at least one tiebreaker. Hmm. I just don't know whether it's going to be in the 3A or in the 2A. We might have two, which would be very unusual. I don't think we've ever had, you know, where we had to cover, uh, you know, a tiebreaker on Monday and then another one on Tuesday or two on the same night. I, yeah, I have a hard time. I don't think I've, we've ever come across that. That would be very strange. Um, I think there's likelihood we will have at least one tiebreaker, tiebreaker situation. And then the format that they use could be different. I mean, mm-hmm. we've had t- tiebreakers where they play it like an, uh, like a, Kansas plan overtime mm-hmm. where you start on the 25 yard line and you, you know, play out the downs and, and you just keep playing until one team has more points than the other. Um, those can be over very quickly. Last year, the three, a used a format in which they started from the 40 and each team got two possessions. Mm. But even that got over very quickly. It felt like when we were, I, we were out there, I was out there with uh, Meg Lochnick that we were watching it. It felt like, some of them went very quickly, you know. Uh, we had uh, a tiebreaker a couple of years back. I think it was with Mountain View. And uh, I think Mountain View ran like two or three plays in the two different tiebreakers they had because they turned the ball over on yep. both of them. And, and it was over just, just like that. <laughs> you know, so they, they played Battleground and Battleground won, and then they played Skyview, and Skyview scored a touchdown, and then Mountain View had their first play from position, and they threw an interception, yeah. and it was over, just like that. So, is there any talk of playing like a mini game, like you know, a I've, one I've half? Heard, I've heard some tiebreakers around the state that they will play like a quarter of football. Mm. Like one tiebreaker will be like twelve minutes of football, and then whoever prevails, and then they go and play another twelve. I've heard that tiebreaker format before. We haven't really used it here locally. 
uh, the risk there is that you don't break the tie in no. 12 minutes and then you're <laughs> back in the same thing. So, and then, you know, so there's, there's the issue of, of recovery. So everyone's playing Friday. So mm-hmm. if they come back on, on Monday, they've had two days of recovery. So that's why some of them are considering Tuesday. But then once you play Tuesday, well, then you got to come back and you win. You got to come back and play Saturday. So it's, uh, it's a tight window to squeeze in all those things, but it's certainly a lot better than it was, I think maybe about 17, 18 years ago when they didn't have this week 10 playoff and all of these playoffs that would happen in week 10 would happen on the Tuesday between the final week of the regular season and the first week of the state tournament. They used to play these games on Tuesday, which I, when I first arrived in Washington 20 years ago, I thought, that's just weird. You, yeah. know, you play three tense, high-level competitive games in eight days. It didn't really make a whole lot of sense. So the WIA you know, created this 10th week so that they can play all these playoffs in the week 10. It's actually, um, it's actually week 10 of the regular season. So if two teams that didn't make the playoffs wanted to schedule a non-league game, in week 10, they have every right to do so. Um, most teams pass on that option because they're the teams that don't make the playoffs are usually worn down by attrition, injuries, and whatnot, so they decide not to. A couple of years ago when a lot of teams were beginning having games that were postponed because of COVID, mm-hmm. um, I think uh, I think Prairie and Battleground came and played on, on week 10 when the other team advanced to the playoffs because the, I think Prairie that year had only played like seven or eight games during the regular season. So... Um, so yeah, so it, it's uh, it's going to be between this recording and our next podcast recording in a week, we could have a whole bunch of stuff. We got week nine games, we've got seating committee uh, mm-hmm. announcements coming out on Sunday, and then potential tiebreakers on Tuesday or Wednesday or Tuesday or Monday, Monday or Tuesday. So yeah, it's going to be a lot going on here in the next week or so. Well, but we're here to bring you all the clarity that we can. 360preps.com. Check out Tim's column in, in uh, tomorrow's paper, uh, or Wednesday's paper, sorry, Wednesday. Uh, we'll, uh, Tim will be breaking down all of these scenarios. And uh, uh, obviously, check in with us on Friday night with our coverage on Saturday morning, and then we will have a story when the seedings are announced. So we will finally have clarity to all this uh, beautiful chaos that we have had during the uh, high school football league or football season here in Clark County. Uh, thanks again to First Pacific Financial for uh, allowing us to use this space, and we will see you next week.